Yep, we're live. Yeah, I, I've got to do a, a segment on this. This paint stripper, they now put on the front here that it's non-methylene chloride formula, and they put it across the front as if it's some miracle and it's non-methylene chloride formula. That's the whole problem with all these paint strippers. That's why they all suck, because they don't have methylene chloride in them anymore. So when people go to buy it in stores, depending on what state they live in, they need to look for one with methylene chloride in it. California can't get it. You can urinate and defecate in the streets of San Francisco. You can build a tent city for 15 blocks in Los Angeles, but I can't get good paint strippers. Go figure. You can, so. poster inside this Racer X magazine. Store. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Vintage Motocross q and I'm your host, Joe Abadi. Thank you, Chelsea, Jordan, and Susie for helping me put the show together. And thank you, the viewers at home who've tuned in tonight to watch the show. Let's get down to the starting line, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what you're going to see. Starting line is, of course, brought to you by Motion Pro. For your tools, cables, and controls, visit Motion Pro online. On tonight's show and the next time try this segment, I'm going to tell you the proper way to pack a gas tank when you're going to ship it to someone. In the Moto Showcase, a 1975 Kawasaki KX250 that was sent in to us by Matt Erdos. Great looking bike. I'm looking forward to showing it to you. Here's the problem segment. We'll be talking about wheel bearings, sealed wheel bearings. Should you use them? Shouldn't you use them? We'll talk more about it in just a moment. In the What's It Worth segment, an original 1974 Hodaka Super Combat Wombat recently sold on eBay. You'll get a chance to put in your guesses on the price. It's coming up. In the announcements, we get a lot of announcements coming up later on in the show. There's a lot of racing going on in California and in other parts of the country as well. Plus some other things we're going to be talking about there. Join us or stay with us rather. We'll bring you those announcements later on in the show. Trivia returns tonight. Finding number 49. This book was sent to us by Keith Geisner. We've been giving them away on the first Wednesday of the month. We're going to be doing it again a little bit later on in the show. It's going to be a live call-in thing. I'll give you the question. Call in with the answer. Get yourself a book. Compliments of Keith Geisner. Finding number 49. Don't forget to share the show, whether you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube. Share it with your friends. Tell them come down and watch the show tonight. It's going to be a lot of action here. We're giving away stuff from Amsoil. So if you're watching it on YouTube, don't forget to comment Amsoil. We'll be giving away something there. We're giving away the book, and we've got a lot of other stuff going on in the show as well. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can enjoy all the shows from Vintage Motocross Q&A in the past. Also, Vintage Motocross Radio. 
If you subscribe, you'll get a little alert like this, tells you when we're live. You sit down and you can enjoy the show, Vintage Motocross Q&A. How are the pros doing it? They're sitting back on their couch, watching it on their HD screen TVs, and they're commenting with their phones. That's how they're doing it. So you can enjoy it from your couch, on your big screen TV, comment from your phone, comment Amsoil if you're on YouTube. There's going to be a winner on the show tonight for that, and it's also a great way to watch the show. If you've got some questions, if you've got comments, if you've got bikes you want to get put on the Moto Showcase, please email them to me. You can inbox them to me at any time. I really look forward to your questions. It's one of my favorite parts of the show. Also, showcasing your bikes, and if you have any comments, maybe you have some ideas of what you might want to see on the show in the future. I'm going to read those comments on the air, whatever it may be. So get into get them into us whenever you can. Inbox me at Vintage Moto Cross Q and A, and we'll be talking more about what you want to see talk about your questions, we'll get you some answers, and showcase your bikes on the show as well. As always, I want to thank our sponsors, Motion Pro, Vinco, Full Circle Racing, Preston Petty Products, Sunrise Vapor Blasting, Racer X Magazine, Northwest Mako CZ, and of course, Amsoil. In tonight's Next Time Try This segment, which is brought to you by Vinco, I want to talk to you uh, live. We usually do it uh, pre-recorded, but we're going to do it live tonight because I just got back from New Jersey really late last night. Couldn't make a video on time, so I decided I was going to do something live for you today. Now, as many of you know, I restore a lot of gas tanks for people, aluminum tanks, Elsinore tanks, Husqvarna. Now, many people ask me when they call me, how should I ship the tank? What size box should I use? I don't want it to get damaged. And that's all very concerning, as it should be. And it's the same when I ship it back to them. But what people don't realize sometimes is an Elsinore tank maybe weighs seven pounds. Same with other aluminum tanks, whether it's Suzuki's, Huskies, whatever it may be. A lot of guys will think, well, the bigger the box, the better, because they don't want their tank damaged. Well, are they right? Yes and no. Here's the best way to do it, really. You want to find a box like this, just a little bit bigger than your tank. You want to put that tank in there, wrap it in a nice soft t-shirt or a towel, then pack paper around it or bubble wrap if you have it. That's going to really secure the tank. But of course, you're worried about, is the box big enough to prevent the tank from being damaged. Well, that's the next thing we're going to talk about. The way I like to do it, the way I ship tanks back to people, is I put it in a box like that. Then I put it in a little bit of a bigger box like this. And you can see right in there where there's a few inches left on each side of that smaller box, where you can then pack it with bubble wrap. And with that, your tank is really, really going to be secure. It's not going to get damaged because you're going to have two layers of protection two layers of the bubble wrap around it as well. But here's where you really benefit from it the most. You're not gonna be charged as much when you go to ship it. Now, I don't care if it's FedEx, UPS, or the post office, they'll always get you on the size. We'll call it an oversized box. And when guys ship boxes, sometimes they'll ship me, uh, ship me tanks in boxes, they'll put it in boxes twice the size of the tank, which is good, but it's costing them an incredible amount of money to ship it either across the country or from Texas or from Iowa or from wherever because the box is so big. And I'm talking a sizable difference, like 50, 60, 70 bucks sometimes. Then they got to pay it to have it go back too. If you do it the way I've told you to do it, with just a little bit of a bigger box over the tank, wrap it in a towel or a t-shirt, put some paper in there, get it nice and secure, and then put it in a box that's about two inches bigger all the way around and put your bubble wrap in there that's the best way to ship a tank. It's not going to weigh any more, and it's not going to cost you anywhere near as much as if you use a bigger box because you do that under the impression that, well, it's bigger, it's got more packing, there's less chance of the tank getting damage. That's true. However, you always get banged out for the bigger box size. So next time, try that. Thanks, Benko, for being a sponsor of this segment. Don't get a box like that. In the Moto Showcase tonight, Sponsored by Preston Petty Products, we're going to be taking a look at a 1974 Kawasaki KX250 that was sent in to us from Matt Erdos. And he bought this bike in June of 2018. It was in a little rough condition. Uh, the rear wheel and the rear shocks were incorrect. It had no front fender. And, but the bike did run. Um, he then had the frame and tank walnut blasted. He had it repainted and finished in the correct colors. He located the correct front wheel. Those KYB shocks are absolutely... Beautiful, they're very rare for that bike too. The front fender and the rear fender were NOS. He also found the correct levers, grips, and number plate. He finished the bike over the next year, and it was done in the spring of 2020. 
during my restoration, I found that there were many parts that were different from the 75 and 76 KX250s. If any of you viewers are thinking about restoring one of these bikes, I'd like to point out a few of those things to uh, people that are selling and advertising or prospective buyers. And if you're buying parts for 74, 75, or 76 KXs, here are some that will and will not work. The seat pan of, of a, uh, is more shallow and different on a 75 and 76 than it is on a 74. The rear fender is shorter and may be different from the 75 and 76. The rear shocks are KYB hammerheads. 75 and 76 are more conventional shock. The front wheel hub is an old style. 75, 76 is conical. The air box is different, has brass inserts that accommodate the screws on the side number plate ovals. The 75, 76 had number, number plates that fit over the air box. The front fork lowers are different. The rear chain guide is a one piece plastic unit. 75 and 76 is a three piece metal and plastic unit. The expansion chamber has a trumpet style. On the 75 and 76, it has a small pickle end. The front fender has a metal mounting plate on the underside. Well, Matt Erdo, she gave us a lot of information on that 75 KX, uh, 74 KX that you've restored and you've done a beautiful job on it. And now people should be looking out when they go to uh, the 75 and 76 models. If you're looking for parts for those, uh, on some of those things, I really didn't know myself that uh, they varied so much. So Matt Erdos, get me your uh, mailing address and I'm gonna get you a nice gift in the mail for sending in a beautiful Kawasaki KX250 to us. Thanks, Matt. That segment, of course, is sponsored by Preston Petty Products. And whether you're looking for number plates, lights, fenders, plastic kits, grips, T-shirts, and hats, Preston Petty Products is the place you want to go. Catch them online on their website or on Facebook or on Instagram. Thank you, Paul and Patty Standard, for all you do. And another great feature that you have on your show are these dimensions that you give on your fenders. It's in a little bit of an alphabetical order sequence there, A, B, C, so on and so forth. You give the width, you give the length, you give how big the mounting plate is on top. And uh, some guys are maybe running bikes with 18 inch front wheels on them. Some are running 21. Either way, when you go to buy a replacement fender for that bike, you're gonna wanna go to Preston Petty Products and check out the size and the dimensions to see exactly how that fender is gonna fit your bike. Just another great reason to go over and check out PrestonPettyProducts.com. The little legend continues. And here's the problem segment tonight. We're going to take a look at three or four of your questions that you sent in in the past week or so. And I'm going to do my best to answer them and give some advice to you viewers at home. Jordan, what do we have up first? Greg Hodges, I recently saw a Boltaco, a vintage Boltaco 125, sell for 80 grand. Personally, I think this is insane, but I also think being in the restoration business, I find these prices inspirational. But seriously, 18000 yeah, I know what bike you're talking about. We had a picture of it on the Vintage Motor Plus Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page, and here it is. The bike was outstanding, probably a concourse restoration in my opinion, and it did sell for $18,000. Was it worth it? I think this was the right job on not quite the right bike. Not that I'm taking anything away from the Boltaco, the Model 131 that this job was done on. It was a beautiful job, but I think it was uh, maybe a little bit too far on the price. I think it was a reach for the for the buyer. Seller, of course, did phenomenally well. I also know that this bike was sold in a package with five or six other bikes. This one sold for 18,000. I know there were a few other bikes in that package that sold for a few thousand less than they were purchased for a few years ago. I know this for a fact because there was a bike that I sold to Greg Albertus, I believe his name is, and uh, Mark Albertus, I'm sorry. And it was Mark Albertus who sold the bikes. So I know he bought a bike from me and sold it for two grand less. And then there's this Boltaco that went for 18,000. I think that was a stretch for that bike. But if a collector bought him, and it probably is a collector because he bought a half a dozen bikes from him, he probably stretched a little bit more on this Boltaco. I think it was a bit much. The bike was phenomenally done, no question about it. Um, but hey, is it inspirational to me? Yes and no, because I've seen bikes sell for a lot of money where the job was not as nice as this. So those are the jobs that really annoy you, where a bike goes for uh, above fair market value, but the job is not that nice. This one went above fair market value as well, but it was an exceptional job. Where will it top out? I don't know. Who do you blame? The buyer, the seller? There's always that conversation too, but that's my feelings on that. 
Mark Tom, I'm looking for a folding shift lever for my 1974 Honda CR250. Why is this such a rare bird to find? It is a rare bird to find in aluminum, but I found one right away. I went on Google and I searched around and I found that REMX or Remix or REMX, however he pronounces the name of that company, I'm not really sure. He actually has one. It is made of steel, but it does have a folding toe on it and it's $40. A lot of guys use the aluminum pedals because they bend easier and the 74 CR250. One of the, one of the things that I've heard people say is they like to use an aluminum shift lever because it'll bend easy and not damage the transmission. I've heard pros and cons about that. I guess part of it is true, but many other bikes use aluminum shift levers as well. This one's available, but it's made of steel, 40 bucks, R-E-M-X. Thanks for the question, Greg. I hope that helps you. Josh Barron. A few weeks ago, you were talking about bearing grease, viscosity, etc. On the older off-road bikes, wouldn't it be a, wouldn't a steel bearing be best? I don't think it would, and I'll tell you why. Steel bearings are, I think, okay for certain street bikes, but there's there's a couple of things that disturb me about them, and one of the things is that you mentioned in the uh, in the question, the grease viscosity. Now. What viscosity are you running in that bearing? What are you doing to make sure that bearing um, heats up well enough to move that grease around in there? Um, when you have a sealed bearing, especially if it's sealed on both sides, you have no choice. And I don't know what grease they put in there. So what I would recommend is if you really want a sealed bearing, but even this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you can put a sealed bearing on one side, but then again, you're gonna put the open end in toward the axle spacer, which is in the hub. Stuff is still gonna get in there. I don't care if it's water, or it's dirt, you're still gonna have a problem with the bearing. In a picture right here, you could see where someone probably didn't maintain the bearing. It looked like it was sealed. It had that steel cap over it and water still manages to get in there and do damage over time. I still recommend an open bearing both sides for an off-road bike like that. You should check them periodically. If they need to be replaced, you can get them out. If they need to be greased and cleaned, you can get to them much, much easier. I understand your point of an off-road bike. Maybe if it had a sealed bearing, they would last a little bit longer. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. They might last longer, but I don't know what kind of grease is in there. I don't know when they need grease. And how are you going to know? I would go with the open bearing and use a quality grease, something that comes from Amazon. Oil. Thanks for the question, Josh. We're going to take a commercial break. Don't forget to keep sharing the show, whether you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to comment Amazon. Oil. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jeff with Motion Pro, introducing you to our latest digital tire pressure gauge today. Now this has proven to be one of our staple products. It is trusted by race teams throughout the industry, as well as Dunlop Tire Techs. We'll first talk about the air gauge head, which has an auto on off backlit display and large numbers. And so it's really easy to read, even in low lighting situations. It reads zero to 60 PSI with high precision down to 0.1 PSI and accuracy of plus or minus 0.6 PSI. Attached to the head is our trapezoid manifold, which is built aluminum in construction and gives a nice ergonomic feel in your hand. It also gives access to our high pressure bleeder, which was designed by Motion Pro. Now moving on, we have this long air hose, which has dual swivels, and so you can get into tight areas and still get a good read at the gauge. And at the end, now included, is our Pro Air Gauge Chuck. It engages positively onto valve cores for extremely accurate readings. So go ahead and pick one up for yourself today. It's available from dealers nationwide. trapezoid manifold on an air valve. Got to have that, right? In the What's at Work segment tonight, it's sponsored by Full Circle Racing. Let's take a, take a look at what we have here, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about Full Circle Racing in just a minute. So what's it worth? 1974 Hodaka Super Combat recently sold on eBay. It was an original bike. And uh, while I'm going through the particulars here, you're more than welcome. In fact, I encourage you to put in the price that you think it's sold for. It is original, it is unrestored, a 74 Hodaka Super Combat Survivor. This motorcycle is in excellent condition for being almost 
50 years old, and it runs beautifully. Bike has never been raced, seldom used, stored indoors. We loved it, and it was part of a large private collection of rare vintage MX motorcycles. The photos say a lot, but there are a very there are very there are very few minor mechanical issues. Uh, the plastic part inside the right pep cock needs to be replaced. There's one broken spoke on the rear wheel, and the air filter is old and it should be replaced. Other than that, other than those few items, this vintage factory Hodaka race bike is ready to be ridden as it sits right now. It recently sold on eBay. The deal was in Oregon, and the price was, you guessing, 25 35 The hammer price for eBay was $4,500 for this beautiful Super Combat 125. It was an original bike. You know, it was very original. It did have a couple little nicks here and there uh, and some of the things that the seller was very forthcoming in mentioning, but it sold for $4,500 in Oregon. 74 Hodaka, Super Combat. Full Circle Racing is still running a special on the hub. You can get them powder coated. Send them up to Tom, he'll clean them, disassemble them, blast them, mask them, and powder coat them for just 50 bucks a hub for $10 more. He'll be happy to do the brake, brake plate as well. Now, this is for gloss black and satin black. If you want it in a different color than that, for just 20 bucks more, a one-time charge, Tom will make them any color you like. Full Circle Racing. For all your spokes, lacing, and trimming needs for both vintage and modern, be sure to contact Tom McAllister at Full Circle Racing Limited. That Bull Taco we talked about a little bit earlier, the one for $18,000, it was posted on the Vintage Motor Cross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page on Facebook. The page is up for about six years now, over 16,000 members. A lot of people are there every day posting bikes they are looking to buy, posting bikes they are considering selling someplace else, and a lot of people are having some great conversations about what bikes are worth and talking about the finer points of the restorations or the race bike. So... If you've got a bike that you're looking to purchase or you're going to sell someplace else, go over to the Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page today, post your bike there, and get some dialogue going on it. I'm inviting you personally. Trivia. Trivia has returned. And as I mentioned, we are giving away the Keith Geisner book, Finding Number 49, about the uh, Harley Davidson Forgotten Race Team. So, no, Jordan, we're not giving away the bike. We're giving away a book. So let's pop up that question, and uh, people can call in. And we'll get a winner here in just a few minutes. Here's the question. This person was born in the U.S., but was a five-time motocross national champion in Brazil. Who is this person? Five-time motocross champion in Brazil, but they were born in the United States. Call in now, 925-234-8181. Operators are standing by with your call. We'll be back. We'll have you live on the show. You can answer the question. Somebody's going to get that book. Compliments of Keith Geisner. 234-8181, area code 925. In product spotlight tonight, which is sponsored by Northwest Mako CZ. They've got that great ship, that uh, Kickstarter special still going on. Just 109 bucks for the big clutch, four-speed Mako, 73 through 75. The small clutch Mako, 68 through 75. The Magnum, the Mega, the Alpha 2, and uh, all the 75 through 77 models. Just 109 bucks. Be sure to mention that you saw it here at Vintage Motocross Q&A. And... Uh, it's just $109. Normal price, I think, is about $122. So I want to thank Alan Brown for being a sponsor, putting all these great products together for the Makos and the CZs. They're all made in America, too. So hats off to Alan Brown, Northwest Mako CZ. Look them up on Facebook or online. They have a lot of products on there on their website, too. Not just for Makos and CZs. Handles a lot of Makuni stuff, a lot of race gear, some other great stuff, too. Amsoil, still got a great special going on for just $46.99, regularly a $75 retail price. But everything in this photo, you'll get it, and you'll be given 25% off across the board for the next six months on everything from Amsoil for being a preferred customer. So just go over to PayPal, amsoilplus at aol.com, include your name, address, email, and phone, and you'll get everything you see in that package right there. And it includes uh, uh, not only the Octane Booster, it's got the firearm lubricant in there, the mud sling, the chain lube, it's a really great little combination, and a funnel, too. Thanks, Russell Waters, for all you do for us here at Vintage Motocross q and I know a lot of guys have bought this for $46.99. It's a great little value. It's something for everybody in that package. We're going to take a commercial break. Don't forget to keep sharing the show, whether you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to comment Amsoil. And when we get back, I'm hoping we have a winner for tonight's trivia contest.
Classic and vintage dirt bikes are more than a hobby. It's not just about the ride. It's about the work that goes in. The work that keeps you connected to the ride. It's about bringing the bike back to life and doing it with your own hands. It's about the adrenaline and adventure. And when it comes to putting all the pieces together, only Vinco knows the bikes and parts the way you do. Vinco, keep the ride going. Vinco, keep the ride going, and as promised, I do have tonight's trivia winner on the phone with me. Hello, this is Joe. You're live on the air at Vintage Motocross Q&A. Who am I speaking to? Hi, Joe. Guy Longwell. Guy Longwell. There was a guy that was born in the USA, but he was a five-time Brazilian national champion. Can you tell me who that guy was? Rodney Smith. Rodney Smith from Antioch, California. Rodney was not only a five-time Brazilian national champion, but a 13-time AMA national champion and Grand National Cross Country, uh, perhaps one of the most accomplished off-road riders of all time. And uh, from our town here, Antioch, California. Guy Longwell, you got the answer correct. I'm going to put Susie back on the phone. She's going to get you your address. And uh, we're going to send you a nice book, Compliments of Keith Geisner, Finding Number 49. Guy, thanks so much for calling in. Guy, thank you, you, yeah, okay, thank you. Guy Longwell, tonight's trivia contest winner. This week in motocross history, is sponsored by Racer X. It was 1949 in this week, uh, this week in 1949 that the White Brothers were born, both Tom and Danny, twins. Uh, together, they had a huge influence on the American motorcycling industry as pioneers in the four-stroke movement, as well as in the aftermarket business with their company, White Brothers. Both were inducted into the AMA Hall of Fame. And I have to admit something. Tom White was a great guy. May he rest in peace. I didn't know him and Danny were twins. I never knew him and Danny were twins. But uh, in 1949, the White Brothers were born this week. 1975, Tim Hart wins the 125 class at Hangtown, a terribly muddy Hangtown classic. 75 AMA Pro Motocross Championship started with a win for the late Tim Hart in the 125 class aboard his Yamaha. Hart was able to better heavy pre-race favorite Marty Smith, the defending champion, who was with Team Honda and pretty much themed unbeatable on that works RC 125. But Smith only finished third in the mud at Hangtown that day. The runner up over was Belfair Washington's Doug Raines aboard a Kawasaki. In five total pro starts that are listed in the vault, the second place finish at Hangtown was Raines' only top 10 finish. And I learned from Jordan uh, a little bit earlier that Belfair Washington is out on the peninsula. And uh, maybe that's why Doug Raines did so well up there. Um, crazy that his name is Raines and he does so well on a muddy track. But uh, he did a great job that day. Tim Hart did win um, that race. I think there were five nationals that year, and that was the only one that Tim did win. Marty won the other four races, 1975. Speaking of Racer X, I've got my latest copy right here, a great magazine, always chock full of interesting information about what's going on in the world of professional motocross, and a lot of great advertisers in there as well. So I do want to thank Scott Wallenberg, Davey Coombs, and everyone there at Racer X. And the uh, really great thing is that we have our ad in here this month. Jordan, can you zoom in on that? Yeah, there you go. Not, not that really, but all right. Well, anyway, our ad is, thank you. Our ad is in Racer X this month. Once again, thanks Scott Wallenberg, Davey Coombs, everybody at Racer X for all you do for the great sport of motocross. In the announcements tonight and border, we have a lot of them. Jordan, what do we got up first? It's been almost a year, but finally there is a date set for the Marty and Nancy Smith Memorial. That will be Saturday, April 24th at 10 a.m. Shadow Mountain Church, 2100 Greenfield Drive in El Cajon, California. Everyone is invited uh, to share their memories of Marty and Nancy Smith.
our good friend Mark Hildebrand from Nightmare Racing is still having the battle of his life with COVID. He's been on a ventilator for nearly a month now. I do want everyone to keep Mark Hildebrand and his family, uh, Lynn, his beautiful wife, and of course his daughter, Ashlyn, who's been in uh, constant contact with me regarding Mark's condition. Now, a lot of people may think that uh, they're hearing some good news about it, but he's still fighting, and he's still fighting a hell of a battle. So please keep Mark in your prayers. There was a little video on Facebook today that did show him uh, doing a little bit better, but Mark has a long way to go, and uh, he's got a lot of friends out there that care about him. So please um, keep Lynn, Ashlyn, and Mark in your prayers. Mark Hildebrand, a good friend of mine, a personal friend for a long time. Finish Motocross Radio. Well, we've been off the air a couple of weeks while I was out in New Jersey getting uh, some food and sun, believe it or not, visiting my family who I love very much. But in the next week or so, we'll have another interview up on Vintage Motocross Radio. Please stay tuned to find out who that will be. And don't forget, you can listen to it at any time. You don't have to be on Facebook or on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, CastBox, you name it. We're on nine different podcast stations at this time. And you can listen to almost all the videos uh, and interviews that I've done through those podcasts. So stick around. We'll tell you more about who's going to be coming up on our next interview at Vintage Motocross Radio. The CZ World Championship is just around the corner. Big event up here in Northern California. The original CZ World Championship Committee, they're on it. The 21 CZ National is about to happen April 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Two days of racing. You got the Robin Hanna thing coming up, the Memorial Cup there. Always a lot of guys come out for this event. And there's a sea of CZs like you've never seen in your life. And from what Jordan tells me, uh, I've got one of the guys on the line, Tim Vasquez, who's going to tell me more about what's going on there at the CZ race. And I think he's going to give us a little walk around the shop, too. Jordan, is Tim with us? Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. Tim, can you hear me? Well, if you hear me, uh, uh, I've been going, I've been to, going the to the city race up there, race up there in Marysville for, for 2013. Every year, it's a fantastic race. It's just yeah, Jordan, he, every he's breaking up. I can only hear every other word. They ever, they ever I, have, made. I have no video. Okay. Yeah, let's Jordan. Let's come back with this. Well, let's come back with this on the show before that race happens, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll get a good connection to Tim, and uh, we'll have a video to go along with it. Move on to the next segment, Jordan. American Retro Cross has a race coming up at Glen Helen, round four. That happens June 11th. That's going to be on the uh, on the vet track at Glen Helen. There's a lot of action going on down there on that weekend. So you got this going on on June 11th on the vet track, American Retro Cross. I know they've got a page on Facebook. I think they have a website too. Check them out online. Another race that's happening down there uh, is oh, we're doing the women's we're doing the women's race too, Jordan, April 10th. There's a women's race presented by the Women's Motocross National Racing Team. That is, uh, huh, can't really see the fine print here, Jordan, um, but there will be classes, women warriors, there's a military and fire responder class, girls 60 cc's, 110 cc's, but I can't really see where this race is taking place. I'll post something up on a page tomorrow that tells you exactly where the race is. Okay, but it is a women's race. Now, here's another one that's happening April 11th, the same, uh, the same weekend as the American Retro Cross race. Tammy and Ralph Greenhill put on a spectacular event down there. The old school scrambles race is happening uh, April 11th, 2021. So it happens from 12 to 4 in the afternoon. Kids ride free, compliments of Rod Lake Racing. So you got the American Retro Cross race on Saturday. You got Tammy and Ralph's old school scrambles race on Sunday. And uh, a lot happening down there at Glen Helen for all you veg guys. Things are starting to open up and looking really rosy again. So plenty of things happening in Southern California for vintage racing. And April 17th and 18th, Pacific Northwest Vintage Motocross Riders, the Boise Inner Am. 
Scott Wallenberg's been talking about this a while. It's a big event. We had Brock Glover up there last year. Brad Lackey's been there in the past, and so many others. The race fees are for the first class are 30 bucks, second class 25, third class only $15. April 17th and 18th, there is a practice on Friday for just $20, and that runs from 10 to 3. So if you want to get up there on Thursday or early Friday morning, have a little shakedown run before the race on Saturday and Sunday, you should get in there early. Jordan Whitworth, Woodworth is going to be up there. Jordan's going to be up there uh, with his Mako. I bet you Fritz Gunther is going to, Fritz Gunther might be going over there and a couple other guys who I know watch the show too. So the Boise Interim coming up April 17th and 18th. SoCal Vintage MX Classic is coming up too. That happens May 1st. Scott Burnworth is putting that race on. It's at Coahuila Creek. They are featuring the uh, Mike Tutol Bell tribute race as well. So that's Saturday, May 1st at Coahuila Creek. And then he's going to be running one in the fall as well. Saturday, October 16th, 2021. That will be at Glen Helen Raceway. So go on Facebook, check out the SoCal Vintage MX Classic. Scott and Debbie Burnworth are doing so much for the vintage motocross community. Thanks, Scott, for what you do. And we're a sponsor of that race, too. Well, I think that's it for the show tonight. I want to thank everybody who tuned in for Vintage Motocross Q&A. Thank you, George, Chelsea, Susie, for everybody who helped put the show together. And for you joining me at home. And uh, wait, you know what I didn't do? I didn't do the, um, I didn't do the Random Share Giveaway winner. Random Share Giveaway winner was Jim Schultz. Jim Schultz, you're the random share giveaway winner uh, for the Amsoil giveaway package. Send me uh, a message, inbox me, or message me. Jim Schultz, you were the random share giveaway winner tonight. And that should about wrap it up for Vintage Motocross Q&A this week. I know who you want to see. He's right here, Gino. Gino, come on, boy. Come on. There he is. Okay. I want to thank everybody for watching Vintage Motocross Q&A. Don't forget to tune in. Vintage Motocross Radio will tell you who's coming up uh, as our next guest in the next week or so. And uh, don't forget, keep sharing the show. Buy a hoodie. Buy a t-shirt. Our product sponsors uh, are, are also would appreciate your support. Thanks again for watching the show.